And we're back for another episode of Startup Hustle, a podcast for entrepreneurs by entrepreneurs. If you want to start, own, or build a business, then you're in the right place. We bring you the real truth about what it's like to take something from concept to launch, from growth, innovation, experience, failing, or winning big, we've got you covered. So let's get down to business with another episode of Startup Hustle, brought to you by Fullscale.io. And we are back with yet another episode of Startup Hustle. Today's episode of Startup Hustle is sponsored by Fullscale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. I'm your host, Lauren Conaway, founder and CEO of Innovate Her KC. And today we are joined by, I, I have this huge smile on my face because we are joined by one of my favorite people in the world. We have with us today, Rachel Smith. And she is one of the co-founders of and CTO of Square Offs, which is a really exciting startup that she's going to tell us about. Um, But she is one of the biggest brains and kindest hearts that that I know. And so we're going to delve deep into who Rachel Smith is, because I know she's got a really compelling, interesting story. Rachel, thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you so much for having me. So good to be here. Yeah, I, I I really am so excited. When I saw the uh, that that you were on my my guest list, I got uh, got super psyched. Well, so so let's let's kick it off, uh, and we're gonna go with a, a little bit of a softball question to start. But you know, tell us tell us about yourself. Tell us you know who you are, what you do, what is Square Offs, all that good stuff. Just kind of give us a baseline. Um. Well, my name's Rachel, and uh, I grew up right here in the Kansas City area. I was always really interested in science and also education. Those were definitely my two big uh, passions. My really whole life growing up, I was always involved in mentoring and tutoring and Girl Scouts. I was a camp counselor. Um, And I also always had a really big focus on science. When I was a young kid, I I always wanted to be an astronaut. But then um, I also wanted to be a teacher. I was always torn. I thought maybe I would go on and be an astronaut for a while, or maybe uh, even if I couldn't hack the astronaut life, just like a rocket scientist or something, and then eventually go on to be a teacher. So that's why I decided to study physics in uh, undergrad and grad school. I ended up getting my master's in physics at UMKC. Um, And then I I did a couple semesters of interning at various engineering firms and kind of just ended up feeling like, you know, the engineer life is not as rewarding to me as teaching at the time. And I think partly that was because I was choosing the wrong areas to work in. Um, But I ended up just going straight into teaching after grad school. I taught uh, as a GTA and then I taught as an adjunct professor at Rockhurst teaching physics And then ended up going to work for a local high school, Bishop Ward High School, um, and taught there for three years. And I loved it. It was wonderful. I loved working with my high school students. But um, there was a a change up with the administration. And um, I had been working as the ACT prep coordinator at that school. And a friend had an idea to build an ACT prep app online so that we could move our our tutoring online and then be able to get more students. And I thought that was a good way to get my foot in the door with uh, web development. So we built the shell of an ACT prep app together. But we never really got it across the finish line, partly because he started business school and got really busy. And then I was able to use that as a portfolio piece to apply for my first web developer job. Um, I Around the time, I, I had started learning a lot about the AI revolution and about everything that's happening in um, online education. And I had started to feel like maybe that was a better use of my skills and talents, like maybe a better way to take my knowledge and love of science and engineering and, and put it into a platform that would be able to be like reused and, and appreciated by students for all over the world instead of just in my own classroom. Um, and I ended up teaching myself how to do web development, mostly through online resources like Code Academy and Khan Academy, which I still donate to. 
um, because I just loved the program so much. It was so valuable. Um, and then also Michael Hurdle's book on Rails, uh, which is a free online um, tutorial that just walks you through how to build a, a Rails app. So that was how I I figured out how to build that first ACT prep app was using Michael Hartle's book and then also the resources on Code Academy and Khan Academy. And through that process, I really came to find these educational resources online were so awesome. Like I, I just felt like I, if I set my mind to it, I could learn anything that I wanted to. It made me feel kind of like what I was doing in the classroom wasn't like wasn't valuable in the same way. Like I felt like I was forcing students to sit there and do homework and stuff that wasn't necessarily catered to their talents, but any kids that wanted to learn that stuff, they could do it for free online. Nobody needed to make them sit there in a classroom to do it. And I think we're actually probably starting to learn a lot more about that now that um, a lot of, a lot more people are doing education online. But um, anyway, so then after we built that ACT prep app and I used it to apply for my first programming job. I got a job at Red Nova Labs where they make uh, like marketing websites and management software for self-storage facilities, which is just about as glamorous as it sounds. Um, but it was the perfect place for my first job because they had a really strong value on cultivating new engineers. And I got a chance to work on seven different repositories with seven, seven different code bases. I got to learn Angular and CoffeeScript and React on both Flux and Redux. I got to learn all of these amazing things. Every time that we had a new project come up at Red Nova that was in a different code base that I hadn't worked in yet, I would immediately volunteer because I knew they would let me do it. <laughs> and I was like, please let me use the time that I'm spending here to learn as much as I can. And so then um, I... Eventually, when I was looking to transition jobs uh, a few years later, um, ended up getting introduced to Jeff at Square Offs. And at the time, I had been learning a lot about uh, like the idea of direct democracy. And when I learned about Square Offs and the idea of like this online voting platform, I, I thought that would be really valuable for so many reasons for like political parties polling their constituents for teachers asking questions in the classrooms and also just for people being able to talk about difficult conversations online and so when I met with Jeff the first time we had an amazing conversation just about what where where we could go with this product and what could be done with it and we were really in line with our vision on it and so I joined the team at Square Ops about three years ago and I've been extremely proud of what we've been able to accomplish in that time. We've seen huge growth and our team is really incredible. Uh, so I feel really lucky to be there. They really, really are. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love the whole, the whole Square Ops team from um, Jeff to you to, I mean, just honestly, the, the whole team is just incredible. Um, so, so, I'm going to I'm going to backtrack us for a second and then I'm going to push us through so that we can talk about square offs some more cuz I think square offs what what you do is very exciting and I definitely want to kind of drill down on that but first I want to go back to to kind of the core of Rachel and I have a question for you and I think I know the answer to this question but do you get bored easily? <laughs> no, uh I I don't know. I think there's a classic saying, if you're bored, then you're boring. Who said that? <laughs> I don't yes, know. Something like that. But uh, I don't, it's not that I think that that's true. I think that if you're bored, then, you know, you're just not looking around enough. Like you're just not paying enough attention because there's never any reason to be. The well, and, and I, th I think that that's actually what I'm getting at because <laughs> one of the things that just strikes me about you is you just kind of offhandedly talk about all of these different knowledge bases that you're able to pull from, you know, physics, um, development, education. Um, I know that you have a passion for, for youth and, and, you know, women in leadership. And like, we talked about that and like, you just have all of these really diverse areas of interest. And so I just, I wonder, what do you think sparked that core of curiosity that, that clearly resides in you. Like you, you just always strike me as fundamentally curious. Like you want to know about so many things and we talk about so many things when we have conversations and I, I love how curious you are, but where do you think that came from? Um, I think, you know, uh, I, I have always been the kid that was out in the backyard trying to dig a hole 
in my backyard to China or like, you know, trying to see if I could set things on fire with a, uh, a microscope, not a microscope. What do you call it? A magnifying glass. Yeah. Glass, yeah. Um, I definitely have always just like wanted to tinker. I also was all the kid that was like my, my mom dated a, an auto mechanic for a little while. I was in middle school and high school and I, I would hang out at the shop and always try to like be connecting headlights to car batteries to see if I could get them to light up and stuff. But I think a lot of that, that sounds super safe, by the way, my just parents. Saying. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like messed around with a Jack <laughs> trying to lift things up with it. But um, no, I, I don't know. I think my parents were always uh, really, they would take us on camping trips and, you know, we had a telescope when I was growing up and my dad would try to explain to me how the universe was expanding. <laughs> and uh, when I, I remember clearly being in like third grade and, and finally, kind of starting to understand what my dad had been trying to explain to me about the universe expanding and it being like a mind blowing thing. Uh, but yeah, my parents and, and also my older sister just always, I think influenced that in me, they've always been the same way. So. Awesome. So, so I'm going to ask you just kind of a, a, a random general question, but what, what's the next thing you want to learn about? Do you have like something off in the horizon that you just, you're just super curious about right now? Absolutely. And I mean, always, I'm sure it's probably like 10 answers, but pick one. <laughs> um, my, well, and actually, I mean, I, this is not anything really new. This is what one of the big things that got me into web development in the first place. And one of the first things that I talked to Jeff about in my interview for Square Offs, one of my biggest passions. And the next thing that I want to get into is uh, brain computer interfacing, which is. Um, Right now, the technology exists mostly as like artificial limbs that connect to your own neurons that you can control with your own brain and, and that even sometimes will have uh, sensory input on them. So you can even like feel things with your artificial limbs fingers. Um, and then they also have like oral implants for people who uh, are experiencing deafness or like um, ocular implants for people with blindness to replace their ability to see and hear by actually sending information into your brain. But there are huge possibilities for the advancement of that technology, especially I think when it comes to communication and sharing of ideas. And I'm really excited about that frontier in uh, innovation and technology. And I would love to eventually become more involved in that industry. So, so I don't often cuss on this, this podcast. I, sometimes I do, but it, it's pretty rare, but I got to tell you, Rachel, like that's just fucking cool. It really is. <laughs> I, I love that you know, your mind is just always so open to, to new possibilities. So, so let's talk about the, the current state of Rachel. Talk to us about square offs. Um, so what specifically is square offs? And, and why do you believe in it so much? Because I know I know that you do. So Square Ups is a debate style platform. Um, it started out as an alternative to a comment section or a forum. We It was embedded on our partner site. So like instead of a traditional comment section in an article, you would see um, a question about the article that you just read uh, with two possible answers. And then you'd be prompted to vote on the question at hand, say the article was about building the border wall. And the question is, do you think we need a border wall between the US and Mexico? And you can vote yes or no. And then after you vote, you're prompted to comment on what you voted. And we've shown that that increases comment rates by like 40% compared to average comment systems and also lowers average comment toxicity and encourages the average person to comment compared to traditional comment systems compared to like just trolls. Um, and I personally think there are two reasons why it's easier for people to get engaged with square offs compared to traditional user engagement systems. And I think one of those is the prompt, the fact that you're answering a question. So then you're, you already have in your mind why you answered it that way. So then when you're prompted to comment, it's easy to just like go ahead and write it out. And I also think it's easier for people to the point to is that it's easier for people to get engaged in a conversation when it's like guided in that way. Like when you feel like you have an opinion that you want to defend versus just like shouting into the void about whatever it is that you think about this article. Um, and so then we ended up getting enough traction and leverage with those partner sites and getting enough um, content 
from we have like local news and college sports and lifestyle bloggers. We have Dear Abby is a, a longtime user now. And so oh, we wow, have, congrats. Yeah, yeah, she's great. They she has great questions. I love uh reading Dear Abby's columns. But I do too. I don't know why. <laughs> she's under the umbrella of Andrews McMeal, which you know is a local company, and we're in talks with them to expand to more of their columns. But anyway, we're um we finally have enough content from all of our partner sites to aggregate it in a way that now we have our own consumer facing site, squareoffs.com, where you can go and get engaged in the conversation on topics from all over the country. Uh, and we are able to put new content on that site every day from all of our, um, we also have influencers, but our, our uh, new sites and blogs and college sports provide enough content. Now we have, different categories and you can also go down there and you follow your friends and see what new square they've created every day. And, uh, so that's really exciting. We just launched that consumer facing site back in November and it's been going really well. And, um, here on the horizon, we're looking at launching mobile apps. Actually this week we're supposed to be launching our mobile app in New Zealand for a trial run. And I'm excited about getting some New Zealanders out there making square offs on the app. Um, and then pretty soon we'll be releasing it in America. And then we're also adding in video. We're working on integrating video into square off so that you can have a, you can already have a cover photo to go with your square off to kind of, you know, picture tells a thousand words, explain the question that you're asking, but now you'll be able to include a up to three minute video as well with your square off. That is awesome. I, <laughs> I mean, I've just, I've watched your growth and I remember like not too long ago, you were tapped for a startling news, like startups to watch thing. And then I, I think I, I read somewhere that you've secured a significant amount of VC funding for your startup. What was that? Can you, can you talk about that at all or um, kind of play it to the vest? It's okay if you, if you do. We're yeah. So we, we finished out our, I think, uh, pre-seed round. Um, I, yeah, we, we've got a lot of really awesome local investors that have been um, really supportive of us. Uh, I'm sorry. I don't know if I, what was exactly the question about that? <laughs> well, just, can you talk to us about, about the VC round that you closed or the funding that you secured? Um, was it a hard process? Oh my gosh. Yeah. The fundraising is never easy. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, and we are actually working on our, our next round right now. We've, we've got uh, um, some commitments coming in soon, I believe, but uh, you know, it's, it's always a struggle. Fundraising is, is a, it's a hard thing. It's, yeah. it's one of the hardest things, uh, being an entrepreneur, finding that access to that capital that you need to, to grow and develop and scale and do all of that. It's really tough. Um, so, so one of the things that I really wanted to talk to you about with square offs is, you know, you're, you're a woman in STEM and we hear a lot about how sometimes it's difficult to, to be a woman in STEM in certain ways, but you have surrounded yourself with this incredible team. And from what I see on the outside looking in, it's like you guys lift each other up uh, every day, I would imagine. But I just, I love the way that you all inter interrelate to each other. Um, so I wondered if you could just talk to us a little bit about the team and what it's like to be a woman leader in technology on this wholly supportive team. Like what does that environment look like? Um, you know, we, I think that so much of it is just like people believing in our mission, like understanding what it is that we're trying to do and why our platform is valuable. And like going back to the investor conversation, actually, I think the same deal there. Like, I feel like we have been lucky enough to talk to a lot of investors that recognize how passionate our team is and then can see how valuable of a product that we have almost through our eyes. Um, because everybody on the team really gets we're all about honesty and open communication and sharing of ideas and coming to consensus and we have a very like democratic process we really are very open with all of our um decision making and we involve everyone on the team on a lot of i mean anything that anyone wants to get involved in their oh their opinion and their uh interest is always welcome and 
I think that that's a really big part of what brings us together as a team is we all, we all know, we all want the product to do well. We recognize what it's capable of and we're like willing to do the work to make it happen and also to support each other in whatever way possible. And we ask each other every single morning, um, what can I do to help you with that? Is there anything that you need from anyone else? And I think that's really important. Well, and you know, great teams are stewarded by great leaders. Um, so I imagine that you have a lot to do, whether you acknowledge it or not, because you're very humble, um, but you have a lot to do with setting that culture. And so I think that that's, that's really cool. What There was a, you went, sorry. What's that? There was a time, you know, there was a time, I guess about a year ago now where uh, we had some core members leave and then we also you know ran on some hard times financially and we it got the team got down to just me and Jeff and I think we that was a difficult time for us but we also were able to get so much done just the two of us and then from there we're able to gather a team around us which is now up to I think 15 people give or take uh it, including like our sales team in New York and then also our offsite development teams that are working on like the mobile app and the WordPress plugin. Um, but I think that setting that core example, like getting down to just the two of us, just me and Jeff figuring out what we could do together and what we wanted our vision to be and like what our focus was and then bringing people in from that point of like bringing people in one at a time that could really meld in with the group and figure out what, the culture was that really helped shape the team in the way that it is now. Yeah. So you had, so basically you had to be strong in yourselves before you could communicate that out effectively to a team yeah. so that they could internalize it. Yeah. Is that what I'm hearing? Okay. And I, think, I like that. Yeah. A lot of it comes from also just the way that Jeff and I set the president of how we communicate with each other and how we like respect each other's opinions and how we lift each other up. I think that the rest of the team that as they've come in, have seen that example and then taken it on themselves. Yeah. Well, that's that's incredible, and I, I love hearing about teams that that are able to reach. You know, teams team cultures vary, but a positive team culture is a positive team culture, and anytime you see that, it's a really gratifying thing. Um, so, so here here's my next question about score apps because I'm very curious. So we've 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 talked about some of the the short-term growth that you expect to see. You know, you're you're launching a new product in New Zealand, you're gonna introduce it in America, you've got a lot of exciting things just on the horizon. Do you have a, you know, five, 10, like long range strategy? Because I, I feel like Square Offs is a tool that pushes societal change. You know, it, it, it opens dialogues and conversations and it, allows people this room and space to think about what they feel. <laughs> um, and so, so I'm just curious, you know, what's the, the long range, long-term plan? Just keep building and expanding our network because I think that our users are going to kind of guide that journey. I think right now we, we obviously have some things on the horizon. We want to build in more user notifications to enhance the network effect. And we want to, we also have, um, an idea on the horizon for having challenge square offs where you have two people create the two different sides and then challenge each other. Um, then we're hoping that some of those things will incentivize uh, people to bring in more and more of their network and people to start thinking of square offs as more and more as the opinion, the home for opinion online, as we like to say. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I think that as we continue to grow and see how more users are, um, using our product and in what different ways, like we just signed um, a contract with MST 3K, Mystery Science Theater 3000. I don't know if you're familiar with them. They're no way. I love Mystery Science oh, Theater. I love oh them so much. <laughs> Your episode is about, it's called Mr. B. It's a, it's an old promotional video for a, um, for a like music company, like that made a, musical instruments and so it was like a promotional video for high schoolers of why they should want to play musical instruments and it is incredible it's so anyway, I can't wait to see what they do with it I can't wait to see what kind of square apps they come up with and um, also that how they use video once we incorporate that I think it's gonna be really cool 
<laughs> that is so amazing. Um, so, well, congratulations. Um, that to me is like one of the biggest wins that you could announce. You could be like, yeah, we somebody gave us a billion dollars. And I'm like, yeah, but it's no mystery science theater. Right? Uh, <laughs> I know. I just need to get I love that. Then I'll be right. <laughs> <laughs> well, congratulations. That That is incredible. Um, so so I've been thinking, you know, when you and I talk, like, we, we don't often, like, sit down and I just, like, pepper you with questions. And I always have a million questions. But there's one thing that whenever, you know, we're out and about and I introduce you to someone, um, I, I, I love to trot out this fact. And you're going to have to, like, fill in the blanks for me because I always get it wrong. But you wrote, you wrote a thesis once upon a time. You showed it to me. And it was about women in the science space. And you're going to have to say the title because it's super long. What is the, what is the title? It's Correlates of Gender and Achievement in Introductory Algebra-Based Physics. And I'm actually like typing it in to my laptop right now because I know <laughs> something that you like to uh, tell people is that um, it, well, so it was it was picked up by NASA. It was like published under NASA, and then it ended up getting listed on um, Science.com at number one on Science.com. Or uh, yeah, there it is. It's totally still there. Number one on Science.com <laughs> for introductory algebra-based physics, um, which I I'm, I am very proud of. It's a great book. I'm not gonna lie. It really is. So yeah, <laughs> hey, so own that. Own it. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's sitting on my on my like mantle in my dining room right now because yeah like, honestly, oh no like I'm picturing it in my head right now and I remember like holding it reverently just like oh this is the thing that I always want to talk about because I just find it so um, it, it's very you like I don't understand the title I'm sure that if I opened it up it would it would just be a big old mess to me but that being said the fact that you're like actually in the brain brain came up with it i love it it's actually <laughs> a very easy read it's 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 only 80 pages and it, you you should you you should at least read the um abstract or the introduction because it's uh okay. it's pretty it's pretty straightforward i mean uh, uh, most of it is just graphs and like explanation of the research but uh the the introduction and the conclusion are both the uh, pretty 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 riveting riveting reads it's it, just conclusions about uh the relationships between um gender and achievement in physics right like that's yeah. in the title but um it kind of goes through like the toys that we're given as kids and the activities we're encouraged to participate in and the clubs that we join in high school and then how that leads to this kind of like narrowing pipeline of um women in physics as you get into higher levels of career and uh, like explains all the cultural implications there, but it particularly focuses on what I particularly wanted to study in, in my book was uh, focus on social networks, on gender identity, but also how that is related to um, social networks, like preference for male friends. And my hypothesis was that I would be able to determine a, a correlation between achievement in physics and preference for male friends. And that was actually very, very easy to es establish a, a statistically significant correlation. So, well, so so I always mention that because I find it fascinating. And one of these days, you're gonna like, you need to write out the title for me, and then I can memorize it. So that way, I'll be, I'll just like always have it. But but that being said, I I wanted to kind of poke at that a little bit because I know that. So you were a Girl Scout. You know, and I, I just wonder how some of your your early experiences formed this highly curious woman who is unafraid of science. Because I think that often women, um, as you as you alluded to, you know, we're we're kind of pigeonholed. You know, girls are good at this, boys are good at this. Yeah. Um, there are you know societal pressures and expectations that are put on us throughout the course of our lives that ultimately end up meaning, you know, we see fewer women in science. And so I'm always really intrigued by women who managed to shed all that and break through. And I think you're just a prime example of that. So I want to, I want to delve into that a little bit more deeply. I love STEMinists. Um, <laughs> would I share a love for science? You have a much deeper understanding of it than I do, but I, I love, I love the pop culture science. Um, <laughs> but 
you know, what was it that you, what do you think allowed you the freedom and the, I guess, almost adversarial relationship to what society may or may not have been telling you that allowed you to become such a a prodigious scientist? Like, that's what you are. (laughs) Thank you. I would, I would like to think so. Um, Yeah. I, well, so I, yeah, you mentioned Girl Scouts. I moved around a lot as a kid. We moved around a lot when I was a kid. I went to four different schools in three years in elementary school. Um, and when we finally settled down in Platte City, which is where I ended up going to high school, uh, I joined the Girl Scouts. They were some of the only people that seemed to really want to hang out with me because I was like a new kid coming into a small school where everybody oh. was in elementary school and they did not fit in. Um, but the Girl Scouts, well, you know, I just, I, lo- I always love being outside. I love being outside and doing outdoor stuff. And the Girl, well, Scout, you still do. the Girl Scout troop in my town in Platte County was really focused. It was led by a wonderful, wonderful woman named Linda Henderson, bless her soul. She's a really important influence on my life. She was so scrappy and outdoorsy and she just never cared about any of that, like being a being a classy woman or any of that, you know, she was rugged and tough and she carried a really cool gnarled old walking stick that she had carved lots of like phrases in and decorated over the years. And she was just like a badass. <laughs> There's no other word for it, but uh, she led her like troop of rapscallion uh, middle schoolers up through um, high school. And we did I mean we would do week long canoe treks where we would camp all of our gear in our canoes and um, camp along the river and we would hike through the woods for days and uh, you know sleep alone at night out under the stars and it was definitely I think that escape uh, gave me I don't know like brought like that was what I like to do that was the kind of stuff that I like to do. So then whenever I wasn't at Girl Scout camp or we weren't doing Girl Scout stuff, I would be out riding the bikes, riding bikes with the neighborhood boys or like exploring the Creek out back. Um, but I, yeah, I, I never, I never got into makeup. I never was like trying to plan my wedding. <laughs> I, I think later in life I started to realize some of the importance of those like aspects of being a woman, I guess, but I don't know. I just never, I never liked focusing on that part of my, I never wanted to like really draw attention to it or I always really just wanted to fit in with everybody else that was like, you know, out catching toads in the Creek. If that makes sense. So no, it, it makes total sense. And, and I just, I love that you were able to kind of forge your own path. Um, well, and I, and I just, I know so many trailblazing women who do that and, and they tend to be the women that I admire most, those who kind of buck the trend. And I, I, I think that you definitely are an example of that. I see. And I never, I really didn't ever want to focus on it or think about it. And I didn't, and it wasn't until I was in grad school that I, you know, I was, I remember going into my meeting with my graduate advisor and Dr. Elizabeth Stoddard, who was, is a brilliant genius. Um, but she mentioned to me when we were sitting down for a meeting to talk about what I was going to study for my thesis. She was like, you know what I think is interesting is that I'm the only female professor here in the physics program at UMKC and you are the only female grad student. And I was like, I am. And she was like, go to your classes tomorrow and look around you and see if you see any other girls. And sure enough, every single one of my classes, there were not any other girls in there. And I was like, how did I not even notice that? Like, I, it did not even occur to me that I was the only female. And so she was like, I think that we should look at that. I think that's interesting. What is it about you and me that makes us feel comfortable in this environment? And that makes you so comfortable you didn't even notice that you <laughs> yeah. were thumb here, you know? Uh, and I mean, do you think that it had anything to do? Because like, I feel like if you have like a single minded commitment to something like, you know, your grad school class is like, this is about science for me, or this is about learning or, you know, I, I wonder, cause, cause I, I, I've worked for a lot of male in, in a lot of male dominated environments, aerospace, it automotive. And I, I, I didn't, 
the times when I didn't notice were the times that I was most solely focused on a mission or a goal or a process or something like that. Cause that was what it was about for me. It wasn't about who was around me. It was about what I was doing. See, and I think that that is a part of it too, is that I think other people see that in you. And so they treat you like a professional and like somebody that belongs there. Like if you prove that you're worth and that you fit in with everybody else and that you have just as much to bring to the table and you, you know, you come into it with confidence and belief in yourself, then I don't think like no one else will treat you differently. And so there's no reason to think to yourself that you don't belong there. Well, I mean, I I would push back on that a little bit because I've definitely been in environments where it didn't matter um, what I felt or the quality of the work that I was doing. Like I, you know, there were some, there were some environments that were pretty toxic, but the right right environments, (laughs) that's where you're going to, you're, you're really going to flourish and thrive. And I guess I, I just feel very proud of you and very happy for you that you have, you know, continued to find homes doing the thing that you love. You know? you a lot of I mean, I honestly, I struggled really bad with imposter syndrome, especially like in grad school. I remember when we were studying for our, our PhD qualifying exam and I was studying with all the boys in my office and they all seemed so much better at it and so much smarter than me. And I was so terrified when I went into that exam that I was going to fail. And then when we all came out of it, I had a better score than any of them. And I was so amazed. Yes. (laughs) So proud. So well, well, that, that is absolutely incredible. And and so I'm going to ask you what I feel is a really important question coming from you. But if you were to talk to another leader, and give them advice in how to thrive, not just in, you know, a scientific field, but just kind of broad-based advice in how to lead, in, in, in how to find your way to doing something that you love. What advice would you give to them? I think the first thing is just like finding something that you can throw your weight behind, like finding something that you can be excited about and be passionate about. Um, because I, yeah, I don't know if you can cultivate a good environment for other people as a leader if you don't believe in what you're doing yourself. So, like, even if it's something like you know, like self storage facilities, like that I was mentioned, I worked at my last company. I could still get really on board with it because I liked my team. I, I plus I you know whatever it's providing a good service for people. People need places to store their stuff. Um, and also just gave me the chance to learn. So it was like, I could, it, I could find positive aspects of my work that motivated me. So I think that just reminding yourself why you're doing something and what is good about it is the first step. And then the next step is being really respectful of your team and like believing in them and, and like showing them respect and also like asking them for help, like knowing how to delegate and knowing how to recognize that, like asking people for help is actually like a compliment, you know, like people like being given structure and support and like being shown that they're valued by being asked for their opinion or for their, their help. Um, but I think like just, yeah, cu- cultivating open conversation and a mutual respect with everyone on the team is probably one of the biggest keys. Well, I think that that is very, very wise advice from a very wise woman. Um, so now I'm going to ask you the fun question. We kind of talked a little bit about this on the front end. So this is not a surprise to you. Usually I like it to be a surprise, but I just think this is a really good question for you. But, um, I'm really interested in the kinds of things that you are consuming at the moment. And I I don't mean food wise. So what are you reading right now? I am always reading multiple things, um, because it kind of depends on the time of day and mood that I'm in, like what I want to read. Um, usually I'm reading like one nonfiction book and one fiction book, but right now I'm a little bit more spread out. I just finished my fiction book, which was Rabbit Run uh, by John Updike. And I really loved it. It was beautiful. I love John Updike, but continue. (laughs) Um, I'm, I'm just finishing up Botany of Desire, which is pretty good. I, I like it a lot. I liked the beginning of it a lot. He's starting to go off a little bit on GMOs and I'm, I feel like that's a difficult conversation, but it's okay. Um, the book that I'm reading right now that I'm probably the most excited about though is uh, How the Mind Works by Steven Pinkner. Uh, and it's 
you know, it's all, it's, it's kind of an attempt at reconciling the fields of evolutionary psychology and, um, the cognitive, uh, computational theory of, of cognition. So like, uh, how your brain works like a computer combined with how your brain formed from evolution and like how those two things would have been related, um, in how our mind works now. Uh, and it's really fascinating book. Awesome. I, I kind of want to start a book club with you. Is that cool? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, let's do it. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, desire so we can talk about it because I'm almost done with it. It's pretty, yeah. pretty fast, easy read. Very, very cool. Um, <laughs> well, so I, I'll tell you what. <laughs> I've been picking her one, though. I probably won't be done with that for years. It's pretty dense. So I'm taking my time yeah. with it. <laughs> Well, well, Rachel, this has been a, a dream come true because I just I love sitting down with you and picking your brain because um, it's it's a big one, a big brain, and it fascinates me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so so you thank you for, for taking the time. Thank you. I love you. You're the best. I love you too. <laughs> uh, you know, on that very, very, very sweet lovey dovey note. Sorry, sorry, folks. Um, <laughs> I have to that today's episode of Startup Hustle was sponsored by FullScale.io, helping you build a software team quickly and affordably. Uh, we, we certainly love FullScale. Also want to remind you, definitely keep an eye out for us on Instagram. You can find us at Startup Hustle Podcast or check out our YouTube channel. We look forward to seeing you next episode.